Hi friends, welcome to another video. I'm so glad you joined me today. This video is a continuation in my series on eating disorders and disordered eating behaviors. If you've missed any of those and or if you want more research and the references that I'm going to be discussing in this video, make sure you click the link to the accompanying article in the video description. So today I want to continue on with a discussion of food addiction. Do you think that you could potentially be a food addict? I want to discuss the arguments for and against food addiction. Now, before you drop that potato chip or start shaming yourself about eating chocolate, let's truly weigh the evidence for and against labeling food as an addiction. I want to do this in this video. I did it a little bit in the past video or the previous video, and I'm going to continue on with probably one or two more videos specifically on this topic because it's such a complex topic and there's so many different caveats to it. So before we get started, I just want to do a quick recap of some of the subtopics I've discussed in this series on eating disorders. And the first was setting the context because it's important to consider the cultural, sociological, and psychological context and belief systems that any behavior is stemming from, including eating disorders. Now, currently we are in a diet and wellness culture and a society that is not only normalizing disordered eating behaviors, but healthcare and wellness communities may be actually contributing them to them. So it might be unintentional, but it's definite unfortunate that many wellness and diet communities have been promoting restrictive eating practices. Furthermore, what I find somewhat perplexing is this is a time of intense scrutiny in many areas of stigma. Yet body size prejudice and substandard medical care based on weight bias is rampant. I feel it was bad enough to face diet culture's damaging messages of sizeism, fat shaming, and food morality. Now, this idealism and perfect specimen of health have etched into healthcare. So let's keep this in mind while we're reviewing the aspects of food addiction and kind of the demonizing of different foods that is occurring in our society as well as in our medical paradigm. Now, in the previous video and article that I wrote, I did provide a summary on some of the overreaching arguments for and against food addiction. These included the implications and tender points of placing a mental health label on an eating behavior. I discussed some of the evidence that supported food addiction, which included the neurophysiology and psychological alterations that occur with food intake, and these different biochemical alterations also impact food behaviors, and how hyperpalatable foods ignite the brain's reward and pleasure centers. I also discussed the caveats of notating food as a substance of abuse, and this included not accounting for restriction and dieting and food addiction studies, how deprivation affects food behavior in humans and rodents, how pleasure in all forms impact brain processing, not just related to food, and the dangers of stigma. And then I also highlighted how food addiction has not yet met the criteria to be classified under addictions. So now I want to hit three key arguments to the next part of this food addiction topic, and then I will continue on again in another video or two as we continue on with this discussion. So just so you're aware, the first three major issues with talking about food addiction, kind of in this summarized point and very concise if you just want the info here and you're in a hurry, is there's an issue of distinguishing between food addiction and other eating disorders because the behavior could be similar, but the treatment would be different. The definition itself has not been agreed upon by experts that proposes a problem, which is number two. And the third major issue is there's conflicting evidence between the mechanisms, the theories and associations in the studies and the actual human trial results. So let's dig into those in more detail. So first, 
there's this blurred line in identifying the differences between behaviors of eating addiction, food addiction, and eating disorders. So for example, those with binge eating disorders Although they might eat a large quantity of food, the reason that they're doing this isn't necessarily because they're addicted to a certain food. It's an underlying behavioral pattern or misguided coping mechanism. So the presence of a behavior like binging is not enough to trigger an addictive-like response without the presence of a substance of abuse. So this can, as I said, blur the distinction between an eating disorder and if we were going to label someone with a food addiction. And that was quoted from the current status of evidence of a new diagnosis, food addiction, which is a literature review. So it, there's dangers in this because if it is a true eating disorder and it was misdiagnosed as a food addiction, most likely restriction and deprivation and avoidance of the food would be the treatment. The problem is this could actually aggravate one's symptoms. According to the Mayo Clinic, when treating a binge eating disorder, you want to avoid dieting because trying to diet can trigger more binge episodes, leading to a vicious cycle that's hard to break. And conventionally, unfortunately, many treat binge eating disorders with avoidance of triggers, and this could be perpetuating the issue. I have a link there in my article to this binge purging cycle and how restriction and food shaming could actually be related to and perpetuating this problem. And I've already kind of discussed a little bit about what happens when rats are restricted from sugar versus when they're not and how they'll binge when they're restricted, but they won't when they're allowed free access. So we have to think of this psychological aspect of kind of this little kid in us, right? The psychology of if we can't have it, we want more. What if we gave ourselves unconditional permission to have foods that we're afraid of as we nurture our bodies? What I found in practice is that as people become more in tune with their higher passions and their bodies become more in balance, food that they were once afraid of or they thought they were addicted to, they can either eat in moderation or just aren't interested in anymore. So that's kind of a little bit with the third mechanism, which I'll get into another in another moment, actually, or the third issue. So the second is that food has not officially been classified as an addiction and it still doesn't meet all the criteria. So there's five dimensions considered important to delineate a disorder of food addiction. You have to have clinical criteria. You have to have one or more validated instruments for quantification of the disorder severity. You have to have epidemiological data. You have to have evidence of a specific pathophysiology and you have to have treatments. So based on this food addiction first doesn't have an agreed upon definition. Although many people are using diagnostic criteria that they are extrapolating from DS criteria for substance dependence and also using psychometric instruments for substance abuse, these still have not been fully quantified or evaluated for food addiction. So we have to be careful with what kind of measurements we're using based on another substance and just extrapolating that into the literature and then using that as proof that something exists or doesn't exist when we still don't have the definition of what food addiction really is. There's also no treatment available. So this is the second thing that food addiction misses as far as getting a diagnosable uh, definition. So there are different potential mechanisms um, which we could look at for treatment. And the author of the literature review that I mentioned earlier goes through these different mechanisms and potential treatments. So you could look at the physiological aspect, which is the neurotransmitter imbalances from serotonin, dopamine, and opi opioids. And pharmaceutical agents targeting these systems could potentially be treatment. You could look at cognitive behavioral therapy and support groups as a psychological intervention. Neuromodulation using brain stimulation might be a potential treatment. Behavioral techniques or macro social interventions such as food taxes. These have all been used for food um, addiction treatments or potential for them or 
they haven't been used, I should say, they've been considered. And some have even been applied to society. The result is that for these different treatments is they may help some, they may not help others, and we still don't know who to apply them to and if they meet this criteria that isn't yet defined. So you can see where calling food an addiction has a lot of different issues with that label. And now I want to talk about the conflict conflicting information between the mechanistic pathways and studies and the human trial results. And although these are very alluring and it looks like a good example for why someone might be quote unquote addicted to food and why they can't stop eating potato chips, blame it on the food, right? Or um, take the food away and everything will be okay. The problem is this doesn't add up in the human trials, especially for sugar. And we talked about that with the rats, right? Earlier, when you restrict the rats, they binge on the sugar. When you don't, they won't. Very similar for human trials. For sugar, if you look at clinical reviews, it just doesn't add up. It doesn't substantiate. So overall, there's three major issues with if we were going to label food as an addiction, in a substance of abuse, we need better criteria, we need effective treatments, these two aren't met. We need to look at the caveats and the potential dangers of causing calling food an addiction and how that's going to impact people with true eating disorders and also the stigma involved in that. And we have to look at if these mechanisms and applying theories actually translates into human clinical data and psychological behavior. And there's just not enough evidence for all of those yet to be met. So I feel it's incredibly, incredibly important to tread this concept lightly because there's a lot of psychological damage that could be done with moralizing food choices and fitness regimes. And I do feel health and wellness is so much more than diet and exercise. And that food is part of, of our culture. And the more that we shame and blame and fight food, the more attention we draw to it and the worse the problem is getting. So it makes me wonder if our society really has a food addiction problem or a soul sickness that's acting out and screaming for attention. Because remember, our pattern with food is so, so, so complex with genetic predispositions, food and health history, culture, environmental exposure, socioeconomics, access, brain health, stress and resiliency factors, and ability to cope with emotional triggers. Can we say that all of these aspects together combine to cause a potential addiction to food? Perhaps, but we don't have enough evidence to prove that a certain food is addictive for everyone. And my question for you is, do we need a label for people who are trying to cope with traumatic and uncertain times in calling that an addiction, or should we view it as a call for help? We're scared right now. And the more scared people get, the more they try to control things. And Temporarily, it can make you feel better to try to avoid the thing that scares you the most, but it never gets to what's really irking you. Food's an easy focus to try to control when the rest of the world seems out of control. We need to get to the root cause of emotional and brain health and mental health. And I'm not so sure that labeling food as an addiction is going to bring us there. Okay. So I'd love to hear your comments. Again, I will return to this topic with a little more detail on another video. I'd love for you to check out the resources in the video description and all that I have to offer regarding emotional, mind, body health, digestive health, hormonal balance, and women's health, and as well as information on essential oils for mind, body support for both practitioners as well as for consumers. Thank you for listening. I really hope that you will comment and contribute to this discussion. I don't presume to be the authority, but I do hope to present you with some evidence so that you can think about this concept as we're being bombarded by it and as eating disorders are becoming more rampant. Okay, take good care of yourself. Bye for now.